Welcome uh, to the 2017 Sheep Genetics Leading Breeder Forum. Uh, thank you for coming. I don't think I need to introduce myself. I think I know pretty much everyone in the room to some degree, but um, for the, a few of you that I mightn't have met, um, my name's Hamish Chandler, uh, but I think most of you would have seen me around for, for quite some period of time. Um, now, I was just going to do the brief introduction, uh, tell everyone what's been going on over the last little while and, uh, and outline what is going to happen over the next, uh, well, two half days. And I thought at first when I started putting all my slides together that it was going to be pretty simple, uh, not much to say. And then I started going through looking at all the things that we've actually uh, done over the last couple of years since we last had a leading breeder form. So, Last one was two years ago. Uh, over that time, we've obviously seen some, some pretty major changes to, to how we, we operate. So uh, for, what was it, uh, 11, maybe 12 years, Sheep Genetics was operating as a joint, uh, joint project between MLA and AWI uh, since July last year. Um, that, that partnership has been dissolved. So uh, Sheep Genetics is essentially now just uh, a department or a, a project run by MLA uh, with AWI contributing through uh, research and development uh, for, for the wool industry. So still working with AWI to make sure that there's opportunity for uh, you know, new research to, to come through the system and be implemented into the genetic evaluation. Uh, some of the other things, obviously, you'll notice a, a few changes of, of staff. Uh, so, we, uh, last time round we had Will Chaffee doing the, the, the land plan uh, development officer work. Uh, we've now got uh, Clara Collison uh, doing that role. So, uh, while I'm on that subject, I really should thank uh, both Karis and Clara for all of the hard work that they've done uh, putting uh, this, this uh, forum together. Um, I've been absolutely no help to them whatsoever, so everything that you see is pretty much stuff that the two of them have pulled together for us. Um, probably a little bit unreasonable of me to expect that uh, someone who attended one leading breeder forum in their first week or two on the job two years ago and someone else who's never been to one to, to organise the event for us, but um, nonetheless I think they've, they've done a great job. Um, and in their defence, they have done everything possible to make sure that we had a whole heap of stuff to hand out to people. Uh, TNT have delivered that to Darwin for us. Um, so <laughs> hopefully we'll have it back in time before the conference is finished. Uh, it was delivered to, to Melbourne last night and then flown from Melbourne up to Darwin specially. So um, I'm not sure how that's going to help us out. Um, anyway, so... So mostly things have, have gone pretty well. Uh, other than that, uh, Merino Select Database Manager, after 12 years on the job, uh, Dave Ruby has moved on to uh, develop some of his own business plans. And we now have Ermius uh, Zerazion, who is um, on staff and, and learning the ropes with how to, to manage the sheep genetics uh, databases and, and, and website. Uh, and I'm sure most of you have already um, been let know in one way or another, but uh, my role has changed. I have taken on the uh, genetics program manager work for MLA, um, and we are currently working towards uh, getting someone new into the sheep genetics manager's role. I was really hoping that we'd be able to make an announcement and let everyone know what's happening today, but uh, we're still working out some fine detail with agreement. So we will let you know what's happening there as, as soon as we can. Uh, but you know, there, there are certainly uh, very good plans in, in place to, to make sure that uh, we continue uh, providing genetic evaluation services as efficiently as possible. Uh, behind the scenes, there's also been a few other changes. So I think since the last leading breeder, we've actually had pretty much a, a, an entire change of our executive committee that are in, responsible for governance. Uh, decisions and so on. So um, Michael Crowley, who is, is now the uh, general manager of the department we sit in within MLA, uh, Richard Apps, who uh, most of you would know, who had previously managed sheep genetics, and myself uh, are now on the, the executive committee. So in terms of some of the other um, 
I guess, good news stories that have come out of the last couple of years. In terms of uh, animal numbers in the evaluation, for example, uh, the first few columns that you see there are the uh, land plan uh, database numbers. The second half is the Merino Select database numbers uh, broken down on a, on a quarterly basis. Uh, so you can see there, uh, last year we finished up uh, significantly on where we'd been in recent years for land plan numbers. Uh, so far the numbers that we've had come through already for the financial year have been uh, pretty solid and the Merino Select numbers have continued to grow year on year as well. So that's, that's a really positive sign, uh, you know, despite having a, a number of staff changes and, and organisational changes over the last few years, um, continuing to grow the service and continuing to make uh, pretty solid rates of genetic progress uh, across industry. So I think that's, um, you know, particularly, say, in, in the Merino side of things where we have been continuously growing numbers of animals in the evaluation to, to keep maintaining those sort of uh, rates of genetic progress at the same time is actually a, a really good news story, I think. Um, customer satisfaction, we uh, go through doing surveys, obviously, on an annual basis. And, you know, obviously, with trying to cover as much of the roles as everyone has been lately, we've seen a marginal decline there uh, in the last 12 months, but um, personally, I'm, I'm pretty thankful that the guys have put in so much work and we've been able to make sure we are continuing to service our client base as effectively as we have been, uh, having been short-staffed, you know, for, for a significant part of the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, I'm, I am pleased to see that we are maintaining uh, the customer satisfaction um, side of things as, as much as we have been. So, you know, I think growth in the number of animals, uh, growth in uh, the rate of genetic progress and hopefully managing to keep uh, servicing our customer base as, as well as we can. Uh, on top of that, um, I will go through this in a separate session, but just wanted to very briefly cover off on some of the, the, the good news that I at least took out of the Ipsos survey that was done. So uh, a number of you would have been uh, surveyed over the phone for this, this survey uh, that was across beef and sheep, uh, both stud producers and commercial producers. Um, and I think the general perception across industry has been shown to be, uh, you know, that there are really quite high levels of, of favourability, trust and advocacy among uh, land plan and merino select uh, members and, and users. Uh, so not just uh, stud breeders, but commercial uh, users of the system as well. Um, and the sort of levels of, of training and engagement that we uh, saw in that, the, those survey results um, you know, were, were quite impressive, I thought. Uh, and you know, one of the, the comments that really came back was that sheep genetic staff are seen as the, the go-to people for, for training uh, in, and information in, in genetic uh, services for the sheep industry. So um, from my perspective, I think you know, that was a, a really positive thing. You know, we have been working towards improving that over uh, a number of years now, so uh, it was very pleasing to see that sort of feedback. I won't... I'll, I'm running faster than the slides. That's interesting. Um, I won't go into this in too much detail, uh, but again, there's been a lot of work over the last couple of years in getting uh, a new sheep genetics business plan uh, implemented and into the system. Uh, the only real purpose of putting this up is to, to make it really clear that we are very conscious about aligning what happens at sheep genetics, what we're trying to do at sheep genetics, and the end result that that actually has out in commercial industry. So uh, the business plan was all about trying to make sure that we know that there are certain targets in the uh, sheep industry strategic plan, meat industry strategic plan, um, and where the, the, the industry is trying to go in general. Uh, so we've, we've worked through what is it that we need to do at the sheep genetics level to make sure that the industry is making uh, genetic progress towards those, those goals. And you know, the sole reason for sheep genetics being in place is about uh, improving productivity and profitability for, for the Australian sheep industry. Uh, so since uh, we were last here for, for Leading Breeder, 
Um, some of the key things that we've managed to, to, to get done, uh, we launched, basically launched MateCell. Uh, I think everyone probably remembers Luke Stevens' very energetic talk from the last leading breeder. I thought we were all going to get a free set of steak knives with MateCell. Um, since we launched MateCell two years ago, um, we've had over 60, I think it is, um, users trained up to access it. Uh, about half of those are, are breeders, half are service providers. Um, so a significant uh, number of people able to operate the system. Uh, and something like 870 odd analyses run for various flocks over that period of time. Um, multiple runs for which, which within each of those analyses that have been conducted. Um, but you know, uptake of, of that has been really quite good. Um, and there are more training opportunities that we will be aiming to run later on this year. Uh, again, since we were last here, uh, in terms of what's happened in uh, use of genomics, you know, genomics went from being research breeding values to being reported as uh, standard ASBVs. Uh, we moved from a single trait, single step analysis, analysing one trait at a time for genomic information to the multi-trait single step carcass analysis uh, that we released last year, um, uh, which was, you know, as far as we were aware, across the, the red meat industry across the world, uh, a first to get something like that in place. Um, and this year we will be moving on to the, the, the full multi-trait single step analysis. A again, you know, right at the, the sort of leading edge of what's happening in genetic evaluations around the world. Um, so, you know, there's a number of uh, projects still going on to improve the uh, accuracy of genomic predictions in that context. So the resource flock, uh, we're still managing to, uh, you know, turn off over 2,000 lambs out of that process a year to, to get more information about uh, eating quality traits, carcass traits, uh, the full range of, of production traits that can be measured early on in life to better inform genomic predictions. Uh, there have been several satellite flocks uh, that we have been running with the assistance of um, several breeders who are in, in the room here today uh, to make sure that we're able to collect more information on some uh, individual breeds where we haven't been able to do that effectively in those resource flocks on, on research stations. Um, Maternal genotyping project that uh, we're running with the sheep CRC at the moment to make sure that we can collect good uh, reproductive records uh, for some of the maternal breeds so that we can start looking more seriously at reporting uh, genomically assisted reproductive breeding values. Um, and uh, some work going on obviously with AWI with their um, lifetime productivity trial uh, information from that trial will be getting incorporated into the evaluation at some point, but we're also working with them to, to make sure that we can utilise some of the weathers out of those systems to, to better inform genomic predictions as well. So taking some of those weathers on and, and slaughtering them and collecting uh, slaughter traits. Um, ramping up genetic gain is another thing that we've moved a, a long way. Uh, we were talking about that two years ago. Uh, saying what we're wanting to do to be able to work a lot more collaboratively and uh, preemptive, I guess, about information that we could deliver back to people to say how well things were happening in their uh, in the evaluation of information from their flocks. Uh, since then, um, you know, working with AGBU, Sheep CRC, New South Wales, DPI, uh, and within the Sheep Genetics team, uh, we've developed those sheep uh, those ramping up genetic gain uh, reports to the point where. Uh, they can start being delivered out to people. I really struggle with Karis's abbreviation of it. I just can't bring myself to call them rug reports, I'm, af I'm afraid, but um, I'll, I'll work with the full ramping up genetic gain <laughs> title, I think. Um, but, you know, we've got an interface in place that allows that information to be delivered back through the, the dashboard on our, our website. Uh, it's available for use by uh, staff and service providers. Uh, and still just finishing off some, some final touches there on how we explain things so that uh, breeders can have access to them directly themselves. And that was delivered to more than 160 breeders this year through their, the regional forums that we ran um, and a, a range of other things. And we'll talk more about what stage two might look like. 
Since last time, we've also had some developments in terms of how we look at uh, genetic research and development and evaluations a bit more broadly across the industry. Uh, so late last year, MLA actually implemented the uh, National Livestock Genetics Consortium Task Force, uh, which is now the, the body that's sort of uh, responsible for uh, looking at what projects are coming through the system for genetics research across beef and sheep and how we get a lot better collaboration across you know, all people who are wanting to play in that space in, in genetics research in the country. So um, we just finished off uh, another open call process yesterday and I think I've got about 28 new projects that have come through the system for looking at new R&D in the genetics space. So um, the genetics consortium, uh, uh, you know, as it says up there, the, 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 the key things it's looking at is how to harness disruptive technologies. So the use of uh, genomics, for example, um, you know, how we uh, manage to change culture of uh, the end users of the technology out in industry to make sure we get better adoption and uptake of, of genetic technologies, drive progress uh, better, um, maintaining world leading R&D and the concept of open data platform. You know, how do we make sure that uh, the results of all of the R&D we're doing is actually accessible uh, to, to other researchers, to people in industry who you know, need to be able to access that information to, to do further work. Um, so that um, is probably a little bit removed from where you guys might be thinking about genetics, but it's been a really uh, big part of what's happening in the background to make sure that uh, uh, research in this area and work towards adoption and extension keeps, keeps moving forward. So I guess uh, one of the key things that we're aware of, um, the CRC's uh, got another uh, 18 months, two years. Uh, what is going to be in place after uh, you know, the CRC's not there to, to manage research projects coming through the system? Um, so I think uh, the beef industry has been through that. Sheep industry will have to manage that over coming years. Uh, and I think this is one of the ways that we, we should be able to coordinate those things um, much better. Uh, some of the things that are coming up, uh, the major things that we'll be working on, uh, the big one that we are hoping to be able to kick off early in the new financial year is a uh, full redevelopment of sheep genetics databases. Uh, so our existing BART databases have served us well, uh, but you know, they have served us well because of the, the people who have, have been running them. Um, Stephen Field does an excellent job of managing the land plan databases, but uh, that technology is, is uh, pretty old by this point in time. I don't think it's actually been supported uh, since about 1993. Um, so, you know, it, it is time to, to look at what new technologies are out there and how we can do a better job of managing those information flows, getting it into the analysis, um, in a much more streamlined fashion, uh, getting reports back to people in a much more streamlined fashion, getting information through to uh, AGBU uh, for running evaluations, getting it through to, to researchers. Um, how do we do a better job of integrating with other databases in industry, livestock data link or MSA databases? So into the future, what are we going to be able to do in terms of getting abattoir feedback data into genetic evaluations, for example? Um, and how are we going to continue managing uh, genomics uh, information flows over, over coming years? Um, so I won't spend a lot of time going through that diagram because I'm assuming no one can read it from where they're sitting, but uh, you know, it's just starting to describe what's the architecture that we're, we're thinking of for how to design these, these systems, how do we make sure that it can integrate or exchange information a lot more easily with uh, you know, researchers, abattoirs, users of the system, how can we uh, make it a lot more streamlined for, for you guys to submit pieces of information and, and retrieve breeding values. The other part of the National Livestock uh, Genetics Consortium uh, that is very much on the radar is the, um, the adoption and extension strategy. Uh, so that strategy has been developed. It's now a matter of how do we implement it. Uh, so that's um, the, the next stage that we'll be looking at over coming months, how to get this in place. But um, you know, the objectives obviously are to, uh, at the end of the day, increase the genetic merit uh, across the, the Australian livestock industry. So 
one of the things that I'm, I'm charged with is managing to double the rate of genetic progress across the red meat industry over the next five years. So um, our Kiwi friends are looking at me to, as if to say, are you, are you serious? So um, it's a pretty significant target um, and I think you know, it is achievable by making sure that we get much better usage of the technologies that are um, out there and available. Um, how do we increase the effectiveness of the use of, of genetic evaluations, increase the uptake and adoption of, of um, improved genetics, um, and making sure that we've got in place a sustainable coordinated extension network. So you can see there that there's some key strategies that have been uh, 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 developed to, to sit underneath that plan, um, you know, proof of profit activities, uh, uh, livestock genetics, uh, network to make sure there are people there to support those messages, national coordination of how that happens. You know, we've got a number of people in place around the country who can act in that space, but making sure they're being coordinated to make, you know, there is a, a common message that is being delivered. Um, and marketing and communication strategy, uh, building capacity um, and interfaces uh, to access information. So. You know, obviously things like the sheep genetics database redevelopment will be, will be part of that. So on to what uh, we, we're going to be looking at over the next uh, day or so. Um, you'll be glad to know that I've just about finished droning on about what we will be doing for the next little bit. Um, so after this, uh, I'll be handing over to, to Karis to facilitate proceedings for the rest of the day. Uh, we've got Daniel Brown, uh, we'll be talking about uh, what's the latest and greatest happening in developing the, the genetic evaluations and getting things in place. Um, Luke will be talking about what the good do well. So, um, you know, where's the evidence of you know, what the good producers have been doing to really drive genetic gain? Um, building on, on the best. You know, we're already doing a good job of making genetic progress, but how can we take that to the next level? Um, Jock Niverson is here, uh, been kind enough to come down from nice sunny New England uh, to, to share what they have been doing in their, um, their breeding operation and how their operation is targeting, clearly targeting you know, improved profitability. Uh, so after that, um, after we've had a bit of a break, uh, come back and uh, David Bevis from Coles has been good enough to come in to talk, uh, talk to us about you know, what's the supermarket or the retailer's perspective uh, on, on what's happening in the industry. You know, where's the balance got to be between productivity and, and quality of, of product? Uh, so I, I think that's a, a really important thing for us to make sure that we're making decisions with our um, consumers in mind. Uh, Mark Inglis from, from JBS uh, was going to be talking again from the, the processes uh, perspective. Um, you know, what's the processes uh, perspective on you know, uh, lean meat yield, how much of an important factor for them is, is that in comparison to uh, eating quality traits? Uh, what are some of the things that are really high on their agenda that we need to be doing a better job of at the moment? Um, Sean Starling, who's uh, one of MLA's uh, general managers, uh, is going to be talking about uh, linking progress to, to process, um, some of the things that we've got coming through in terms of objective measurement uh, to make sure that we can capture information to, and, and deliver it back to people to assist in the direction that the industry is going in. Uh, then uh, Tom Bull uh, from Lampro uh, is, is going to talk about what their business has been doing in terms of uh, you know, what sort of end pro product are they, they producing, uh, what direction is their breeding, their breeding program going in and how they are investing in, in R&D themselves to, to make sure that that happens. Uh, we'll introduce him later on obviously, but uh, Kevin McDermott is, is here from Ireland and I think we should be really grateful that he's um, turned up to talk to us, seeing he's only been in the country for three days. Um, I think he'll still be awake by that time of day, but uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, tomorrow morning, uh, uh, back into some of the, the more technical stuff, Andrew Swan talking about uh, how we're using genomics in genetic evaluations, uh, including eating quality and, and breeding objectives, um, and you know, how, how to drive progress that way. 
Uh, Tom Granley's uh, from the Sheep CRC, uh, talking about you know how to work smarter. I think is probably the best way instead of working harder to try and uh, achieve our, our goals. Ferg has come back over the ditch from New Zealand. Um, I, yeah, Ferg's always had a good way of terming things. Four feet closer to the perfect sheep. So um, the the progeny test work and so on that's happening over there. Um, and you know how that's actually going to be able to influence what we're doing here with breeding programs. Uh, where was I up to, Ferg? Then we've got Sally Martin. Um, some of their findings from the work that Merino Link has been doing, uh, and uh, you know putting some of the, the other talks in a bit of context about how have they managed to implement some of the DNA technologies, what works, what doesn't work. So the, the last session that we'll go through, uh, genetic tools that are available uh, for, for gene improving genetic gain. Um, Clara and, and Karis talking about um, what you can actually use off the Sheep Genetics website in terms of tools that are available. So um, I think there's a few tools that have been there for a while that some people might not be aware of. So uh, it'd be good to go through some of that. Tim Byrne from, from uh, Abacus Bio in New Zealand uh, talking about uh, you know, some of the proof of profit side of things and how do you actually drive economic improvement um, with, with breeding objectives. Uh, I did miss, sorry, a couple of the little three minute talks that we've put back into the system. Um, Daniel uh, was going to do a three minute talk on weaner mortality, some of the latest research and development that's happening there. Uh, Tom Granley is doing uh, a three minute talk, very quick on uh, uh, how to breed for, for pole genes using DNA tests. Um, I'll go through the Ipsos survey and some of the findings of that, uh, where we're up to with um, perception of genetics and genetic evaluations. Uh, and then to finish off, Nathan Scott uh, talking about motivation and, and driving change. I think the thing for me that came out of those Ipsos surveys is really about you know, a lot of the lack of uptake is about lack of motivation or, or apathy, um, not enough people looking to, to actually drive change. So uh, I think that should be a, a good way of finishing things off. So I'll call it quits there and let someone else more interesting stand up and talk. Uh, so I'll throw back over to, to Karis uh, to introduce the next speaker.